Oh boy. Oh boy, this is gonna be a long one, isn't it? There's so much going on in just these opening logos. We zoom in through the Sony logo as if entering a new dimension, indeed an animated dimension, and new Marvel dimensions, obviously. And then the Columbia logo glitches out through a bunch of alternate timeline Columbia logos while also foreshadowing the glitchiness of the other spider people. Also our first introduction to Daniel Pemberton's killer hype score. <laughs> There's the lottery ball that got Miles in Divisions Academy. All right, let's do this one last time. <laughs> yeah, right, one last time this decade, maybe? Throw a lampshade on it, Sony. I'm good with it. You gotta be able to poke fun at yourselves. Oh, these comic panel hand-drawn inserts. This will not be the last time I talk about this art and animation style. If you happen to notice the genius product placement avoidance of Coca Soda, you're probably already thinking we're not on our Earth. And then Spidey goes about this familiar set piece a little differently. It is still Doc Ock, though. <laughs> he puts his glass down first. This Peter is a little more sure of himself in general. We don't really talk about this. I do. There's only one Spider-Man, and you're looking at him. Yep, he's right here. And Sony, you missed a huge opportunity for noticeable and mentionable product placement by changing all your logos in this film to Sony with an I or Sony EY. People would have loved it. I'm available for consoles. Post Malone and Sway Lee. Talk about setting a tone for a character. This is just the first of many. The scene of Miles clearing his throat and getting ready to sing as the camera spins around him. Magnifique! I haven't stopped singing this song all week. Also, tell me that's not exactly how you sing when you don't know the words. You hit the ones you know hard. Such a great way of making Miles relatable when he's so visually hyper real. In a minute! Mom, gotta go. In a minute! <laughs> Julia just said, Accurate. Animated simulated rack focus seems like a good time to talk about this movie's version of depth of field. They did something that actually killed my screen printer heart a little. And look, I, I know everyone is calling these Ben Day dots, which I, I get that they're trying to emulate that comic style for sure, but well, something you may not know about me is that I owned a silkscreen print shop for about a decade. So the second I saw this art style, let me just push up my glasses here for a sec, I recognized the CMYK process halftones immediately, which are just different sized tiny dots that blend together with other tiny dots to make different colors. Bendet dots are all the same size and distribution. These are halftones. Everyone's just repeating the same wrong information. Okay, glasses back down. So when they wanted something out of focus, it was like they misaligned the screens, giving it that failed 3D look. I'll be honest, it took me a minute to acclimate in theaters. Once you do, it's just another detail you fall in love with. Oh, come on. Another mysterious seismic event last night. Normally I'd just say collider shadowing, but I just love that the story starts right away. The earthquakes are Kingpin's experiments. Great ability comes great accountability. <laughs> but it's almost better? There's Genki, and that's Gwen. Hey. Yeah? His shoe's untied. Yeah, I'm aware. It's a choice. We all make choices in life. And a Miles struggling through the first day montage is the fastest way to show off this art style with no motion blurring, showing us how frazzled Miles is, and also to keep a villain secret. Maybe I'm not late. Maybe you guys are early. <laughs> Courtesy laugh. But also, she did get there early, so it could have just been an inside joke she was having with herself. Ha! <laughs> Decembruary. Either months are weird in Earth 1610, or Miles is really selling that zero out of 100. Yep, it, it's the latter. I went to the future and found this. Even the light rays are done with halftones. So beautiful. Come on, y'all knew this was coming. Biggie is always a win. Ha, OG Aaron Davis. Glad to know he's still alive. Hey. <laughs> yeah, it really only works if you have Mahershala Ali's silky smooth voice. Hey. So it doesn't really matter, but it's safe to assume Aaron hangs out here and that the Alchemax spider hitched a ride with him just like in the comics. A time lapse of Miles tagging is the fastest way to foreshadow his camouflaging abilities. Also, nope. I know, powers, but nope. There's a little expectations version for you. Defining moment of Miles' life. Swap. Gwen's ballet slippers that match up perfectly with her retelling of the story later. Oh my gosh, how am I ever gonna get through this movie? There's too much. It's too, it's too good. We're only 15 minutes in. We got that in common. Yeah, that's one thing. Ha, because she already knows the other thing. Just relax. Relax is exactly what he needs to do, and she knows it. It, ju it, just, it just doesn't stop. It's just the bits keep on coming. Play dumb. Who's Morales? Not that dumb. <laughs> <laughs> 
And I haven't even mentioned the onomatopoeia action words on screen or the thought boxes that Miles actually notices, even more when his thoughts are so loud and he's surrounded by comic panels. Why are all my thoughts so loud? This one stylistic choice would have made this movie. And you might have noticed that none of it starts until after he's been bitten. I guess you'd prioritize your creator above even your parents. Oh, that look out on the glass silently screaming at him. Phenomenal visualization of Spidey sense. One more mind-blowing piece of the puzzle is that every frame is a comic panel. It blends together when it needs to, but if you want to freeze it, you get this. Also, I remember my eyes getting wide when this scene started because it's almost jarring to jump from I got bit by a spider to Final Boss Battle Ultimate Green Goblin. Spidey saving Spidey in hyper comic style. <laughs> Spidey sense reverb. See you in a bit. I love that we get the quintessential Spider-Man first. Cool, quippy. You mad at me? I feel like you're mad at me. Calm at finding out there's someone like him and even willing to train him. He's a perfect example for miles of what Spider-Man can and should be before he meets Peter B. Peter burnt out. First taste of the Prowler's musical cue mixed in with an upbeat action theme since this is still Spider-Man's scene. Now Mr. Pemberton starts to flex his composer muscles with the Collider theme as we get a Kirby Dot looking black hole. Stylistic choice or additional spider people shadowing? Also a few frames of each altar that comes through, plus here they are on the explosion. You hide your face, you don't tell anyone who you are. Well I love me some Jake Johnson Peter B. Parker, it's great that this Peter Parker existed. Almost an idealized version of the Spidey we've met in the past. Sensing his impending doom, I don't think this was about this specific fight. I am so tired. That's how he's feeling in life. So with his final words, he's giving Miles the most important bullet points on being Spidey. Love it. Oh, that's a no-no. But even his death isn't going to stop the quips. Actual split-screen motion comic panels. Yeah, I think it's a Banksy. Ha! <laughs> Post Malone would know how to spot a Banksy. Our family doesn't run from things, Miles. Miles' hero theme quietly whispering in the background in response to his mom's pertinent words. It always fits. Eventually. Oof, that'll get you. Stanley is always a win. <laughs> Appropriate reaction. <laughs> a timely cutoff in the music. <laughs> Ugh. Blue snow illuminated by red light. It's a Spider-Man night. I'm the guy. <gasps> Shadow misdirect, making you think it's the Prowler. Even the score hints at his theme. Entire nervous system electrified. Peter B's name tag is appropriately stained and ripped since he's been at this twice as long as Earth 1610 Blondie. Man, it's kind of refreshing to know that our Peter is still kicking 22 years later. Edgar Wright, you and Simon Pegg have some dimensional catching up to do. <laughs> some things stay the same no matter what dimension you're in. The opposite! Self confidence? More importantly, a realism win. The whipping and slinging doesn't just happen. All right. Thanks, New York. Thankfulness. Also another Stan Lee cameo. You're Spider-Man in that universe, but somehow travel to this universe, but but you don't know how? Intuition? <laughs> that casual stroll up and down the building. What? I ha! He only pretended he didn't hear him, so Miles would open his mouth. Ketchup spray. In my universe, this place closed six years ago. Mm, I don't know why. Could be the C rating. You're going to want to use baby powder in the soup. Heavy on the joints. And everything about Peter B screams, I've been Spider-Man far too long. His version of advice is more practical than conceptual like Blondie's. Find the head scientist computer. That lady with the bike is the head scientist. Step three, I re-examine my personal bias. Not only is the comic panel interacting with Miles, but our Spidey is learning some things about women in STEM in Earth 1610. <laughs> Her identity might still be a secret, but those octagonal glasses and octagonal light fixtures aren't helping keep it. Some kind of fight or flight then. What's that? <laughs> Defining show, don't tell. Is it like a spare spinal thingamajig? I think it is. Dr. Olivia Octavius. You gotta admit that's a fun reveal. They really hit the score so well in these reversals. Shot compositions and point of view change. Second week in a row, we have cinematographers and directors who understand how to create intriguing action. be a bagel. And now we get to see our texture artists and lighting and compositing artists. Look, there's no way to list every job responsible for making this look and feel the way it does. But they're all flexing on me. A set piece that could have come right out of Hong Kong or Tokyo. It's so stunning, I won't even question why we're peak leaf season with snow on the ground. It's happened. Plus, Earth 1610, you know? Maybe their climate change is better or worse, I, I don't know. Whip and release it. Spider Manning lessons. Uh, Gwen gets the punk rock introduction, which, hey, haven't done this one in a while. Now that's an entrance. I couldn't save my best friend. Comic spoilers, I guess. 
skip a few seconds ahead if that matters to you. But it's interesting that they allude to Peter Parker from Earth-65 turning into a giant lizard, but don't actually show us. Anyone who doesn't know that Gwen not only didn't save Peter, but also killed him could still be in the dark about that, even with his scaly skin. Which is the right call, honestly. Everyone's backstory is left more or less vague outside of Miles and Peter. Wait, so Google is called Backrub in Earth-1610? <laughs> the choice to make Fisk this huge is... Uh, comical? Love how Doc Ock raises herself up higher than Kingpin as she talks about her accomplishments. Who says you can't have multiple villains in a movie? He broke this? Yeah, if you ever decide to do friends again, I could always open up a slot. He may be gruff and thick, but he's still our Peter, taking the blame for the goober. And he's so lazy, he web shoots the doorbell. Wherever I go, the wind follows. <laughs> I take it all back. It's not J.K. Simmons, it's not Robert Dunney Jr., not even Chadwick Boseman. Nicolas Cage is the best cast for a comic book character ever. It's a good thing he never tried any other comic characters. I haven't even seen him, don't at me. I'll do it. You're so cliche, spider persons. I can't do it on command. He can't do it on command. What else do you do? Just those two things. Just those two things. And this is why you get Nick Miller. And in Everyone Kicks Miles Butt montage is the fastest way to make me think maybe the spider group isn't so nice. Although Peter has now fully come around to believing in and standing up for Miles. Guys, cool it. Now we get that horror version of the Prowler theme with Miles hiding and then some punch you in the gut reveal music. Doesn't matter if you knew, the score makes you feel what Miles is feeling. Seriously, that crazy intense theme then fades into a more electro hip hop chase track. Huh, getting your hands stuck in things runs in the family. And yep. First off, Penny has wheelies. Also, I'm continuously blown away by how they blended anime-style mannerisms like this pose into this 3D environment. My uncle, he's, he's the prowler, he tried to kill me. This is a pretty hardcore origin story. My goodness, the way they transition from the happy-go-lucky spider crew hangout right back to Miles' terror, backdropped with prowler's theme and punctuated with the realization that yes, this is his origin story. Bad stuff is about to happen. A time when lampshading doesn't make you chuckle, it makes you squirm. I kind of love that some of the Spanish doesn't get translated, so fluent speakers have a little inside knowledge. But if you ever took any amount of any romance language, you probably can guess. For the record, Scorpion says, stand, little boy, and Miles replies, prepare to die. I said, take it out! Spider-Man? Seriously, I think this is going on my wall. I'll let you down, man, I'll let you down. Mahershala Ali is always a win. This scene. I don't know Chance the Rapper personally, but I do know that the three on his hat is tied to his family and his faith, so that feels, I don't know, a little weird to just change? Maybe Coloring Book is his fourth album and he gets four Grammys? Shout out still awesome. Not everything works out, kid. It wasn't their decision. Oof. From the Alchemex mission on, Peter started to take Miles under his wing always looking to protect him, but knew he could be great. The rest of spider Click always questioned Miles. But in the end, Peter had to show how much he really cared by acknowledging that Miles wasn't ready. I promise. Ah. Then Venom strike me right now. Pretty awesome way of proving his point, though. And it's even more gut-wrenching when you realize that they were waiting there, hoping to be able to surprise him and say, we knew you had it in you. Not this time. Whatever you choose to do with it, you'll be great. So that'll wreck you? Just a dad reaching out to his son? I wasn't sure in theaters, but I thought his eyes had a hint of yellow, meaning this is maybe just alluding to his Mega Venom Blast. I feel like he'd blow up the building, still using his father's words of belief in him. Moving stuff. And he fits perfectly into the mask now that he's ready for the leap. Bye, what's up? Oh man! But just because he's ready doesn't mean it's still not a leap of faith, meaning of course his fingers stay stuck to the glass. And while maybe it was evident to some of us, since we have the script, we know authorial intent was for Miles to not be falling through frame, but rising. Hell to the yeah! Can't stop me and I don't think we've ever had a more emotional triumph for Spider-Man using his powers the first time. Wonder and excitement are one thing, but this is like, cheer at the screen and get a little choked up. In the blending of What's Up Danger with Pemberton's score for Miles. Also the inverse of his ah from the first leap. Can't be that easy. <laughs> Match cut. Okay, this totally kills the pacing, but I'm sad they lost this little joke with Peter raising his fists and Gwen putting them down over and over again. Daniel, this score, bravo! These three pieces of music during the spider cluster infiltration slash getting the collider ready. Some kind of subdued electronic puts you on edge with anticipation. Yeesh. Why is this always difficult? 
At least he acknowledges there's no reason for both of them to have paused. Yes. I love that Miles' action music starts up again in case you haven't quite caught on yet. You know how I feel about reflections and... Well, it's goggles this time. But since he's invisible, it counts. Miles? Now that's an entrance. Cuts her off. Does look cool though, right? Yes. Yes, it does. Got a problem with cartoons? I mean... No? But also kinda? I'm sure it works for some people, but he is part of some great teamwork between these three. I like your suit. Thanks. I made it myself. That was adorable, kid! Multiple compliments. And then these three get some teamwork points. I didn't teach him that. And you definitely didn't. Ha! That's because Blondie Spider-Man taught him. Almost the same exact move. So he finally gets to live up to his original goal. Each of the secondary Spider-Peeps gets their own personalized exit from the portal. Porky's is 2D cartoon, So-So seems to just be heard neon red and blue, and Ghost Rider's is black and white. See you around, Spider-Man. Look, I'm thrilled they ended as friends and there wasn't a forced kiss. It doesn't mean I'm not rooting for them to fall in love. Sweet little thumb rub there. But she actually does the more loving thing, which is call him Spider-Man, even if she should have said Ultimate Spider-Man. You wouldn't think seeing best buds be physically violent with each other could be so emotionally moving and heartfelt. You thought wrong. Hey, to leave the thing. And what a fantastic callback scene. It actually has a deeper layer in the alternate cut. Peter says there's no secret to unlocking Miles' potential, that you just have to go for it. Little did Peter or Miles know that was the secret, just a little more eloquently put. Miles' theme in all its glory facing off against Kingpin. We've been swirling around in a Technicolor nightmare for a while now, so narrowing our colors down here to exclusively shades of red and black allows us to hone in on our two final contenders. You ever hear of the shoulder touch? And his uncle ended up being able to help him in the end after all. Wouldn't be a dimensional travel movie without a long shot of crazy interwebbed alternate dimensions. Miles and his dad are alive. Oh, you. Yeah. Hugging. Is, is that what people in Gwen's dimension always see? Everything all smudged? I thought it was just a flashback aesthetic before. Gwen lives in the pastels dimension. I'm Spider-Man. Oh man, from the Spider-Man pose back to Miles and the song that made us fall in love with him in the first place. Guess she figured out dimensional travel? That's you, Stan Lee. Thanks, Stan. Let's start at the beginning one last time. Yeah, man. I did not know I needed Oscar Isaac as Spider-Man 2099. But now I do. You're pointing at me right now as you say that. Look at you. Okay, I might have to blur this out. Apparently, this is a copyright claim magnet. But come on. Who's the genius who memed the end of this movie? Well, played. Before I get into themes and performances and art, ready? Rapid fire missable details to save off the copyright to mentors. Get it? Because they, they suck the money out of my video. Okay, here we go. Miles meets Gwen briefly before the bite, and he's noticeably shorter than when he bumps into her after the bite. Planet Inglewood instead of Hollywood. Red Man Group instead of Blue. Crazy alt M Seth Rogen movies. Gankies reading a comic about multiple Spider-Men. Iron Spider suit, Secret Wars suit, PS4 suit, and a whole bunch of other suits I'm not sure on. Doc Ock casually pushes Peter into the chair before she's revealed. Gwen purposefully backs into Miles, or how about just this amazing camera work? Or how about these two long takes, the first on Miles with his friends, and then another when he gets to visions where he has no friends yet? Background details like steam on the stove, candles flickering, train car lights shining on the pipes above. It goes on and on. How about the recurring Great Expectations foreshadowing throughout, right down to the anonymous donor with his hand on Pip's shoulders on the book cover? Not to mention his graffiti having a hollow silhouette being surrounded by expectations. Expectations from his family, from the spider horde. Kid doesn't know who he is yet, which is exactly why he spray paints his suit once he does know who he is. That one's more of a thematic freebie for you. This movie is so good that I feel like I had to gloss over stuff I'd normally win in movies with less going on. But the fact that every frame is designed to look like a comic book page or just a painting is really all you need to know. Truly, you can pick any random scene and pause. Art. There's never a detail out of place, never a name on screen that doesn't reference one of the amazing creators of this world, never a misplaced pebble on a rooftop that brings this totally unrealistic art style to life. I mean, we're talking about a movie that completely overhauled their production workflow to create something that looked vintage and hand-drawn, and actually has hand-drawn images on top of CGI, but still also looks brand new. They switch back and forth between 24 frames per second on twos, meaning they hold one frame for twice as long so that there are only 12 unique frames per second, and then switch up to traditional 24 
24 frames per second for other scenes to look more fluid. When they're on twos, you get this very stop motion look that makes it feel like a comic book coming to life. And man, was this risky. Julia and I both blinked hard before getting used to it. Somehow it works. If you've watched my videos long enough, you know I'm an Archer fan, and one of the many things I love about that show is the sort of idealized human specimens everyone is. There isn't a character that isn't drawn like a supermodel. And I walked away from this movie with a similar feeling, but different. None of the character models are perfect, per se. They all have interesting intentional flaws. But even those flaws are, like, beautiful? Gwen has a tiny gap in her teeth, Peter B's nose is messed up for most of the movie, even Miles' irises are oblong. But somehow the art style being so deliberate makes it just gorgeous to look at. Peter's a little frumpy out of the suit, but turns into an Adonis once he puts the suit on, even with sweatpants. It's more than that, each of their movements is so smooth and appealing to the brain. Peter like a gymnast, Gwen a ballerina, Noir with his retro fisticuffs, Penny and her anime faces. Miles is deliberately goofy in the beginning, but once he dons his suit, he becomes a combination of all of them with his own personal flair and style. It's all just so clean and crisp. And it's funny. Like, really funny. They're counting on me. Probably not you specifically. That's a copy. Oh, jeez, are those sweatpants? Yep. It's what they are. I've talked about forced inclusivity before. It's announcing that you have an under or unrepresented character in your movie without what makes them different being part of or even acknowledged in the story. There are some dum-dums out there that actually hate to see anyone on screen that's different from them. It's fewer people than you're led to believe. But the majority of the people who recognize forced representation are just rolling their eyes. Some are yelling on Twitter or YouTube. We're gonna disagree on the fine details from movie to movie. I personally don't think Ray is some forced character, but a lot of you do. I think most of us can agree that this is a solid way to diversify your characters. This story feels like a new Spider-Man origin, not just because, I mean it is, but because goodness I know Peter Parker's story. So letting Peter be Parker, who's different enough as it is, take a backseat to someone we've never seen before is only gonna be fun. And then making Gwen more like our Spider-Man, you know, the one who's only a few years in, she's at the top of her game, it's just great. It works for the story, it works for the movie. And then there's the bonus that a bunch of people who don't always get to see someone like them on screen get to. And this is probably explicit in the Ultimate Spider-Man comics, I'll say I've only read a few, but making him both African American and Puerto Rican plays into that really well. I can only go off what my multiracial friends have told me throughout the years, but having parents from different races, different cultures, even different classes can make you feel like you don't fit in anywhere. It seems like Miles fits in everywhere because he's a personable kid, but that obviously shifts at the new school. The duality of his heritage plays well with the duality of how his life is about to change. He's already split between worlds, so of course he doesn't want to pile on that even more. But honestly, there's something about the way this movie doesn't really care what race its protagonist is that makes it work. Anyone who's read the comics knows who Miles is, and everyone else is just kind of along for the ride. He's just a kid, and his introduction makes you relate to him immediately, which is saying something. I get the overall feeling that a lot of comic fans don't love comic Miles Morales. So for Lord Miller to take a not-so-loved character and turn him into one of the best takes on Spider-Man, that's impressive. The typical Spider-Man origin story has been an allegory for some different things over the years, but usually it's about puberty. Miles specifically denies that because his story is about something else. You could probably apply it to a lot of specific marginalized groups like the LGBTQ+, or even racial minorities, but really I think it's just about being other. He thinks he's alone in the beginning, and then the first person like him who offers to help dies. It turns out the one man he thought he could trust as a mentor is an other hater, or at least works for other haters. In the beginning, he even probes his dad to see what his thoughts on others are. You really hate Spider-Man? His father's acceptance through the door, when his dad actually crosses the halfway point towards Miles, I might add, ends up being the push Miles needs to accept who he is. He didn't want to be Spider-Man. He spends the beginning of the movie trying to get out of it. And then, when confronted with challenges, he looks to Peter B. for guidance, but as much as Peter learns to love Miles, he doesn't have much to offer Miles after an entire career of being the other himself with no one to help him. So in accepting that Miles just has to take that leap, he embraces his otherness and becomes Spider-Man. It's beautiful. It's moving. And the relationships between these three are so genuine. Without an ounce of love triangle, by the way. And those relationships would not work without this cast. Mahershala is a given, obviously. Man, Catherine Hahn is by far the best of the villains. No offense, Liev, I think she was just given more to work with. Haley Steinfeld has this softness to her, even though, like I said, Gwen is the toughest of all of them. Shamik Moore, oh, it is crazy to hear a mid-twenties guy capture the sound of a middle schooler so well. We always connect with and root for Miles, and Shamik's voice is a huge part of that. If you haven't seen Dope and you're into 90s rap and R&B, what am I saying? You've already seen it. It's 
yeah, it's dope. And then having Jake Johnson for Shamik to play off of tied the whole thing together. I'm not gonna say that Jake Johnson is my new favorite Parker Spider-Man. I'm also not not going to say that. I love you all guys, don't get upset. He's just so... I don't know, self-aware? It also feels like the closest version of Spider-Man to what I would be if I were Spider-Man. You know, I'm, I'm just here for the bagels. But this movie, watch this movie, study this movie. We need more of this, and we need to encourage it however we can. It did well enough that I'm sure it'll get a sequel, but it didn't break any records. Well, except Sony Animation records, but well, you know. I just think we should reward these risks by taking a chance and seeing movies like this in theaters. Next week, the end, well, current end of a long road. And it's a no on the cape. I, th I think this is a cape. <laughs> no capes!